self-harm that we do. It feels like a very alien behaviour to lots of adults. Um, but if you talk to your average 14-year-old, um, they will talk about self-harm as a perfectly kind of normal way of coping with difficult, um, difficult thoughts, feelings, experiences, um, which is one of the reasons we're seeing a big increase in prevalence. So one of the things to understand about self-harm, um, and it can help us to understand why it can be difficult for, for young people to, to overcome it in some cases, um, is that it, it can quite quickly become a, a kind of cycle that's difficult to come out of. It's not true for all people. So for some people, self-harm is transient, and um, it will be in response to a difficult moment in their life. So maybe something really tough has happened, um, they've got feelings they don't know how to deal with, and that once that situation is resolved, they don't return to the harm. So for some people, it will be something they do just once, or for a very short period of time, um, and, and they're able to move on. For other people, it can become habit-forming, and whether or not it becomes habit-forming um, is, is often down to how quickly we're able to respond and support. So, so young people can get kind of trapped in this cycle. So it starts with, with these sort of big and difficult feelings. So any feeling, essentially, that a young person doesn't know how else to deal with. So they've got these feelings they don't know how to cope with. So they might find themselves turning to unhealthy coping mechanisms. And this is usually just because they don't have any healthy alternatives. Um, so, yeah, so they might turn to unhealthy coping, and um, this may be simply because they don't have healthy coping strategies. So, one of the things we can do in terms of prevention is teaching young people healthy coping alternatives. So, we can teach that to every child um, from a very young age. Healthy coping, co co bleh, find my words. Healthy ways of coping with big emotions, very, very helpful for them. Um, but so, they may find themselves turning to these unhealthy means of coping. Um, they're more likely to turn to lots of these behaviours, and, you know, there's many more behaviors um, they're more likely to turn to these unhealthy coping behaviours now than they would have done historically, just because they're more um, they're more aware of them as much as anything else. We see these talked about often in the media, um, for example. So they're, they're kind of available as a potential strategy. And the thing is that when somebody uses these uh, these kind of unhealthy coping mechanisms, then in some way it relieves the way they're feeling. For some people that's not true. For some people they try it once, but a friend did it, and they said, you know what, it made me feel a lot better when I cut myself. And that young person tries it, and they don't get anything out of it, so they never do it again. You will see that sometimes. If you see that, that's fine. We don't, we don't need to be particularly concerned about that child. But for lots of people, they try it, and actually for a little while, everything feels a bit better. Maybe they feel numb for a while, because they've eaten a huge amount, they've binged, and then it made all those difficult things go away. Maybe they um, actually felt something, they felt some pain, perhaps they're depressed and they can't feel anything else, they felt some pain for a while, and that felt good. You know, the, uh, or it might be, um, if they're sort of cutting or burning, they might get an actual physiological pine. So like drug taking, we'll get this rushing the orphans, the adrenaline going through, if you harm yourself, sometimes you'll get those feelings, and that feels good too. Um, and so, you know, just for a little while, and that's good. If things are difficult, it's good, for things to be okay, even for a short while. However, the behaviours that we associate with self-harm generally come with these kinds of feelings of guilt and shame, particularly at the beginning. So particularly when a young person first starts using these behaviours, they can recognise them as weird, as freaky, as not a way in which they should be coping. They might think, what would my mum think, what would my dad think, what would my teacher think, <coughs> what are my friends going to think if they find out, they feel guilty and ashamed and they think they should be able to cope in a different way. Um, <laughs> so essentially those feelings of guilt and shame add back into the original feelings, the big feelings they didn't know how to deal with, which they've done nothing about. Because, you know, cutting yourself, it might make you feel better for a while, it doesn't do anything about those underlying problems and feelings. Um, and so you just added more into the, into the melting pot. Um, you still don't know how to cope with them. The only thing you found that worked was self-harm, so perhaps you find yourself returning to it again and again. And the tricky thing with this cycle is that those feelings of guilt and shame, as they do the behaviour more and more, they disappear. Because the more times you do something, no matter how bad, weird, whatever it is, the more times you do it, the more normal it feels. And that's one of the things we'll look at later on. So in terms of how we help young people who are entrenched in this cycle get out of it, there's two key things we need to do. One is we need to try and address those underlying feelings. Um, and that might be about a change in situation. This might be a young person who is using self-harm, for example, to cope with the fact that they're being abused. Very, very common for young people who are abused in any way um, to turn to self-harm. So it might be that we remove them from that situation. And that might be the first step in, in, in beginning to deal with this. It might be that there's something that we can't remove them from, but we can help them work through. So it might be that they are trying to cope with feelings surrounding, say, a bereavement. Um, and we help them to process that. And as they begin to, to learn to resolve those feelings um, and come to terms with things, that their self-harm begins to, to become easier to manage. Um, the other thing we need to do is think about what happens in those moments of crisis. 
So for you, these young people, they are in a habit that every time they can't manage anymore, and that's a moment when we can't really process clearly and we don't know what to do, um, then, we, then they need to automatically turn to self-harm, and we need to help them learn to turn to other things. So two key things there is the underlying stuff, and this stuff, dealing with the big feelings, this is our kind of more intense one-to-one -one work, kind of the rounds of your, your sort of counsel or therapist. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So that's really common. Yeah, that's really common. So we're going to look next at some of the really common reasons that underlie self-harm. So some of the reasons why young people say they do it, some of the things that might trigger it. However, for lots of young people, particularly at the time at which you come into contact with them, they're not going to be able to clearly articulate what's going on here. They'll be very, very muddled. And if they do not have um, a way of working out kind of what those big feelings are, what underlies them, perhaps stuff is repressed, um, then that can be quite a long process to work through. And it's just about us helping them um, to, to explore emotions in a healthier way. So we'll be doing lots more of our, um, our general work. And we can often begin to learn about those triggers by doing things like diary keeping. So we often find that if we're getting a young person to record how they're feeling repeatedly throughout the day, maybe on a scale, that we can begin to identify certain times of the day or certain times of the week where we find that they are feeling more anxious um, or more angry or more upset. Whatever we've identified as some of those feelings that, that trigger this behaviour. It's about looking for those patterns. Um, and, and over time, sometimes we can begin to help them identify them. Does that make sense? <coughs> okay. So, yeah, so there are two key things. So the big feelings, this is, this is your long play. This is not the, the realm of, you know, just, just any old person sitting down for a couple of hours with a child. This is something that <coughs> might take weeks, might take months, and it can take quite a long time before you begin to keep the fear of going anywhere. The unhealthy coping is something that we begin to try and address immediately. This is about keeping that child safe, both at the moment, you know, if they are self-harming, maybe thinking about how they can keep themselves safe um, in that, at that moment, and then also trying to replace those behaviours, so substituting 